Should have started it all. Yeah, come on. Okay, great. So what we would be doing today, we just touch on the second part of excretion, and then I would look at some questions based on reproduction. Yes? Okay, let's go. Okay. All right, let's start at 23. So each nephron in the kidney, each nephron in the kidney is made up of several parts, including, I'll take rule at the end, including what? When you look at the nephron. So all of the above. All of the above, yes. The glomerular yeah, capsule, the proximal, yeah, distal yeah, the loop of the nephron. So if you were just to quickly look, let's have a look. Um, now, I don't know, from, if you could just look at an image. Why is the proximal convulated tubule called the proximal convulated tubule? Anybody? Because it, proximal means close. So the close. Proximal, yeah, yeah, the one that's close to the Bowman's. So proximal is close and the distal is far away. Yeah. So proximal it just means close to the uh, Bowman's capsule. Why do they call the Bowman's capsule the Bowman's capsule? After the person that found it. Yeah, the person's name was Bowman, yeah. If you spend a lot of time, they put your name on it, not so? So for instance, let's say if Alison Taylor had found it, it would be called the Alison Loop, right? The Alison Tubule, right? So let's say if Chelsea had, had discovered it, it would be called the Chelsea's capsule, it has a nice ring to it because it's a double C. If the here had it, it'll be the here's capsule. But Bowman was the guy who figured it out. So he named it after himself, the Bowman's capsule. Because he spent a lot of time in the lab, right? So that's why. Let's go forward. So this one would be all of the above. Something is a capillary not inside the glomerular capsule. So when we're looking inside the glomerular capsule, right? So inside there, this is the glomerular capsule, also known as the Bowman's capsule. Did I do, yeah, did I do screen sharing? Yeah, so inside of there. So what is that called? The glomerular is very good. Let me take, let me take, um, give. and as I say, after workout, I was giving you all marks on that. Um, so let me open up the, the ting -ting -ting. Um, teacher record, teacher kit. Today is Wednesday, Wednesday. Attendance, no, not attendance, we're looking at grade. Ooh, some people have been doing quite well, yeah? We are happy to hear your thoughts, okay, that's nice. Right, so who answered that one, Glomerulus? Who answered? Ravina. Ravina, let me see Ravina. Ravina, see that. Ooh, Ravina, yeah, yeah, Costa. Oh, I see. How to take attendance. Okay, the way how this thing does work. Okay, no, it's, it's just not behaving. Somebody else has read so the answer. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice of you. I think you have to take attendance first before it actually things, which makes sense. I'll just run through. Uh, Miss Rock, President, Akia, Alison, Amrita. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amrita. Yeah, Amrita. Okay. No, no, I thought you said Ramuta. Oh, no, no. I just go in, in order. Let me see alphabetically from your first name. Aviel, yeah. or Av Av Aviel, Selena, Shanice, Chelsea. Well, I know Chelsea here. Yeah. Dahia, I know Dahia here. Yeah. Daniel, Davika. Yes, sir. Davika or Daniel? <laughs> Daniel, Davika. Daniel Ramita. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Diane. Diana. Yes, yeah, so Diana. Uh huh. Diana Brewster. We have Diana Archibald, yes. Who and Diana Brewster in here? Nope. Okay. Um, Eleanor. 
Hello. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Janine? Nope. All right. Um, Kamal, yes, I know you're here. Kizzy, yes, I know you're here. Lucille? Lucille stepped out for some tea. Michael? Natasha? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Ravina? Yes, I know you're here. Ria? Rishma? Yes, Sarah? Sir. Rishma I'm is here. here. Yes, I am here. Okay. Sarah? Okay, thank you, Sarah. Ria? Ria not here. Okay. Uh, Sasha? Suchan? Shady? Present. Mm -hmm. Shania? Shaquilia? Shaquila? Charlene? Yes. Stephanie, Suzanne. Okay, great. So let's see who answered just now. The glomerulus, who was it? So was Ravina. Somebody else. Ravina. Anybody else? Ravina? Yeah, Ravina doing very well. Anybody else who answered? All right, so let's go in terms of the glomerulus. So one of the things to appreciate with the glomerulus, if you were to have a quick look at it, you notice the glomerulus is convoluted. Now, why is it twisted up like this? Anybody? What, the reason why it's twisted up is because it builds, it builds up something that begins with P. That is essential for how the filtration process, because it's convoluted. Oh, yes, yes, who's that one? Eleanor. Eleanor, very good. It builds up. Pressure and I, I heard somebody else in the background with Eleanor. Ravina. Well answered, Ravina. Very good. Right. So it builds up pressure. So one of the things you have to remember, take home from the kidney. The, the way that the kidney filters is by pressure filtration. That's always important to remember. So the pressure builds up, and you have the filter filtration process occurring through fenestrations or slits, which are present in the Bowman's capsule. Right. So literally the blood comes through here. It filters out all the waste, and the waste actually then collects and passes through all the way down to the collecting tubule. As it passes along, depending on the requirements of the body, you could have reabsorption of some of the electrolytes, particularly sodium, potassium, and chloride ions, right, in this portion. And then for any the collecting tubule in particular, you could have the reabsorption of water under the influence of EDH. Right, antidiuretic hormone. Let's get back to this. Um, urine formation consists of what? When you think about urine formation, all of this, all of the filtration. Yes, all yes, above. all of the above. Right. Who answered yeah. there? Eleanor. Eleanor. Who else? Ravina. Ravina. Who else? Kamal. Kamal. I know we tired that we fight it. We soon done, soon done. <laughs> Anybody else? And that was a very good um, discussion I had with your Kamal. You got, you got um, props on that one for that. Right? That was quite a, quite a lively discussion we had. That was very good. You got some extra points on that one. I'll bump you up. Very good work. OK. All right. Let's look at 28. The pattern of blood flow about the nephron is critical to urine formation. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. That is true. Who, who answered there? Natasha. Natasha. Rock. Right. Miss Rock. Kizzy. Shady. Kizzy. Shady. Who else? Uh, who else? Amal. Amal. I got you, Rishma. Uh huh. Rishma, yeah. Kamal, right, very good. Kamal. Um, so excuse. Mm -hmm. Um, Ramuta said he had to be left and back in three meters. Oh yeah, I just let him in. Yeah. Right, Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Anything? Uh, right. So that's important in terms of blood flow. The, the pattern of blood flow about the nephron is critical to your urine formation because in terms of the amount of blood that actually passes through, that would determine the amount of urine because of 
when you have more blood, you have more filtration, and therefore the formation of urine in that regard will increase the volume of urine that actually passes through from the level of the glomerulus, whether or not the urine at the distal point in terms of the collecting tubule, if it is, that's the amount that's actually um, let or leaves the kidney via ultimately the ureters, well, that is under the control of a hormonal control of ADH and depends on the selective reabsorption, as we mentioned, of different ions. Let's look at 29. The filterable components of the blood that moves across from the glomerulus are what? Water, nitrogen, waste, nutrients. Hey, so. good. Who said that one? Ravina. Ravina, very Kizzy. good. Ravina, and whom else? Kizzy. Kizzy, very good. Yeah, right. And that is very true. Water, very important. Nitrogenous waste, mainly coming a lot coming from the breakdown of proteins as well nutrients and salts those are the ones that move across the glomerulus they are able is blood and sugar are they able to cross usually no sir. blood cells no right which is why if you do have blood in your urine it could point to kidney disease it doesn't necessarily mean kidney disease. Why is that so? If you see blood in your urine, why does it not necessarily mean kidney disease? But it could, it could but doesn't, there's not a direct connection then. If you see blood in your urine, you have kidney disease. Why is that? Sometimes it could be um, scarring from like a kidney stone. Yeah, so in other words, it could be from something distal from the kidney itself. Let's say, as Kamal mentioned, very good, you'll get the props on that one, right? Something, let's say, a, a blockage of a stone, so therefore you have bleeding at a position distal to the kidney. If the stone, let's say, is at the level of the prostate, you know, somewhere there, causing um, a blockage, which ultimately could, because of the formation of the stone, that could actually penetrate the membrane and lead to bleeding from that position. So it doesn't necessarily mean uh, it is from the kidney that bleeding is coming. It could be from a distal site. Very good. Let's go again. Let's look at 33. Reabsorption is called re reabsorption because only molecules recognized by carrier molecules are actively uh, reabsorbed. Selective. 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 So that is selective, right? Yeah. Very good. The answer is C. And why is it called selective? Because not recognize molecules so certain ones can react. Correct, yeah. So it's only certain ones, right? Good. Um, come on. Who it was who said selective, by the way, just now? Come on. Yeah, yeah, Kamal, I, mean, I have you. Uh -huh. so who else? Diana. 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 Diana Archibald. Okay, good. And who else? Who? Miss Rock, as, right? And Ra Rishma Ramsawak. Rishma Ramsawak, thank you. And Ravina. Okay. Ravina. Okay, right? Very true. Selective, so that means it only it chooses. There's not everything that comes through, but the certain ones. So therefore, you would have the binding to certain um, molecules to cause the reabsorption. Let's look at 36. Drinking alcohol causes diuresis because it inhibits... First of all, what is diuresis? When you have body pressure Excess of Thank you very much, Sarah. Yep. That's when um, Sarah had it first, when you um, excessive urination, or as we say in the colloquial language, when you pee. So alcohol causes, quote unquote, peeing because it inhibits the secretion of what? ADHD. All right. Who's, the, who's that one? Who's that one who answered there? I don't know. I'm somebody else. Eleanor. And Ravina. Ravina. Right. ADH, antidiuretic. So very importantly, right, when you look at diuresis is urination, and a diuretic is something that makes you diurese, right? 
a diuretic makes you um, urinate or pee. So therefore, anti means again. So antidiuretic is something that you know will stop you from urinating. So therefore, if you block something that stops you from urinating, you know you will be able to urinate. So which is why drinking alcohol it causes urination because it inhibits the secretion of ADH. And I think a lot of us can identify with that either from personal experience or usually when you see somebody passed out in a drunken state or something like that. Usually if you do look, let's say in the crotch area, you'll see evidence of urination. You know, you'll see a, a, like a wet spot, right? Which is evidence as well that, you know, yes, urination has occurred. But in general, I think we can identify with that if it is, let's say even from a social perspective, you drink a beer or some particularly beers, right? It could, you'll feel the urge to urinate. And that is because alcohol, it blocks the effect of ADH, which usually prevents you, you know, stops the um, urination from occurring, all right? So always be mindful of that. And that is why, you know, when you're around persons who, let's say drink a lot, you, you often see them going to the bathroom quite a bit. Good. Let's look at 38, juxtaglomerular apparatus. It secretes renin, is that true? Yes, it, yes, it is true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. Right, it secretes renin, right? In terms of well, that's what it does, its primary function in terms of the what it does. If the kidneys fail to function, what would happen to the nine? Let's look at 39. Uh, B. The, ooh, so answer that one. Yeah, Diane. Diane, very good. Claro. Diane. Catalan. Yes, thank you, Diane. Mm -hmm. Right? So one of these things, if the kidneys fail, that's it. Right? Renal failure becomes a life-threatening event. And what would you have to do? If your kidneys fail, what has to happen? What's the next step? Dialysis. Okay. Dialysis. Who's Dialysis. that one who answered first? Somebody answer first. Ms. Rock, Diana. That was it. Diana Archibald, very good. Right, so you have to go on dialysis. Has anybody ever witnessed dialysis or anybody here is a dialysis technician or anything like that? Have any family or anything? Witnessed it. But... Witness it, yeah. yeah. So how, how, how long does it take? Few hours, actually. It depends on, on the hours. condition of the person, I'm guessing. Yeah. Two to three hours and they have to go like about two to three times a week, yeah? Mm -hmm. Right, so it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a little bit of a process where that is concerned. So a good thing is, not with science, in fact, you could be genetically predisposed for it to happen. But it's always a good thing, you know, to drink lots of water. What's a good way? Let me ask you this: What's a good way to get up early in the morning? If it is, let's say, you have an exam for six o'clock in the morning, what's a good way? What you could do in the night? Other than set your alarm. Anybody ever tried it? That is like a surefire way, most definitely, of waking yourself up. Drink like, you know, a lot of water in the night. Let's say two large glasses. We're looking at any region of, let's say, anywhere between half a liter to a liter of cold water, let's say. Drink it. And believe you me, around four or five o'clock, you will get a wake up call. Yeah, that's that is one way definitively, notwithstanding the set your alarm, that's one way to get up early in the morning, most definitely. Let's look at 40, infection, infection of the bladder is called what? Let's see. Who said that? Who said that? Yeah. Natasha and Ravina. And, and Daniel, Rashi. okay, let me start. Let me start with Daniel first, and then Ravina. And then Natasha. Shady. Natasha. And Kizzy, sir. Kizzy and Shady. Mm -hmm. Sir, I'm going to Shady. Who else? Rock. It's Rock. Uh huh. Who else? Diane. Diane. Do, 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 do. Diane. Yes. Yep. Yep. Got it. Mm hmm. Right, very good, right? So cystitis, right? That is uh, infection of the bladder. Let me ask you this. In terms of bladder infections, do we usually find it greater among men or women and why? Infection of women. the bladder. Women. Why? 
Why? A very simple reason. Why is it more? Why is it greater among women? It has to do with the structure. Let's so women intend to um, hold their urine more. Okay. Um, I can't comment on that. Though I do remember when I was young, <laughs> however, I used to have a teacher. You know, that, that's probably one of the... Anyhow, I know you all would do this, even as a parent or anything like that. You know, sometimes you go to the teacher and say, you want to go, come on, hold it in, be a man. So I and, think it's because of the referral or something. Yes. The referral is shorter than a man. Who... It is. I was trying to pull up. I'll do that. Yes. <laughs> And who is that who answered? That was Miss Rock? Diana. Diana. Very good, Diana. I, I got two points on that one because that was a little complicated. Yeah, it is. If you were to look right here, let's look at this one. It's a nice diagram. Right? Look at the length of the urethra in a female as opposed to the male. It actually um, exits at the end of the penis. Yes, sorry, somebody wanted to say something. Uh, Susan wants to be left in the class. Sorry. Mm. I'm not seeing her. I'm not. She probably disappeared, but I'll keep her eye out. Forget when I get a prompt, I'll let her in. But I'm not seeing anybody currently taking a prompt. Once I see it, I'll let her in. Do it. Thanks. But yeah, so from the bladder, in terms of voiding of the urethra, the female is a lot shorter. Right? If you look at it, it's a lot shorter than the male itself. The male zone ends at the end of the penis itself. So this is why it's more susceptible in this proximity to the bladder itself. Right? Right? Because of that short distance. So when we look at the vi vagina, the vagina, of course, in terms of the environment, it is quite acidic. And we'll speak to that shortly to see what compensations in terms of the delivery of sperm and semen what compensation then has to be done by the, the, um, the different glands, also the, the prostate, corpus, and bulbourethral, those secretions, what they do is they secrete um, an alkaline, alkaline substances, which literally neutralize the acidic environment of the vagina. Other than that, if they didn't do that, the sperm will be destroyed, right? So they'll actually die before they reach. So we'll talk about that just in just a second. Okay, last question as it relates to the urinary tract, and then we'll move to reproduction. Let's look at the last question. Right, so this one, modern hemodialysis involves what? C, D, regular, regular hookup to the patient's bloodstream, yeah. So they usually implant, is implanted, they, Sometimes you would see it depending on where. Sometimes it's in the neck, in the leg, or in the arm. You will see them. They implant a tube, tubing to hook up to the dialysis machine itself. All right. So the answer is indeed D. Who answered that one? Okay, nobody answered that one. Ravina. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ravina. Somebody else. Mm-hmm but they're being shy, so it's all good. All right, so that was that one. So let's move over ever so briefly to reproductive system. Oops. All right. All right. The testes lie within what structure? The testes. The scrotum. The scrotum. And why does it lie within the scrotum? I think it has to be keep it cool. Keep it cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why does it need to be kept cool? I'm being devil's advocate today. Why does it need <laughs> to be left cool? <laughs> Right. So in other words, indirectly, what they're saying is then um, these lower temperatures actually favors uh, sperm production. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. true. Um, so for somebody who has, let's say, a male, let's say they're having some, he and his partner, they're having fertility issues. And let's say they, it has been, um, you know, uh, it's found that the male has a low sperm count. What can actually help boost his sperm count. 
boxers or briefs, briefs or jockey shorts, as they call it. Which one would 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 actually promote it? Boxers or briefs? Boxers. 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 Yeah. Boxers. So you know, have it swinging, have the air free circulation of air around the scrotum that will cool down. Approximately, what is the ideal temperature for sperm formation as it relates to body temperature? How much degrees Celsius below body temperature is ideal for sperm formation? 27. 27. 25. Well, okay. <laughs> I know. What is normal body temperature, by the way? Let me make sure I get 27. Calibrated. 27. 27. All right. So relative to 27, who said 25? It's usually about two degrees Celsius below normal, right? So 25 would work. Whereas 27 wouldn't affect it, but the ideal temperature, if you're looking at is two degrees below body temperature. We're not looking at core temperature because the core temperature is 37. But we're just looking at body temperature. So around 25 degrees Celsius is ideal for sperm formation. Good. When we're thinking about semen on the topic of semen, right? Semen, of course, is not only sperm, but also sperm mixed with secretions from the prostate, bulbourethral, and um, which other gland? Prostate, bulbourethral, and seminal vesicle. When we're looking at, at semen, now the normal ejaculate, when you're thinking about ejaculate, normal ejaculation is approximately five milliliters of semen, which is about a teaspoon. How much sperm do you have in a teaspoon? So in five milliliters of semen, how much sperm do you have present there? Huh, anybody wants to gander, wants to make a guess? So in five milliliters of semen, how much sperm? You'll be presently surprised. So you'll be pleasantly surprised to know how much. So in a teaspoon, how many? How much sperm? How many sperm? Is it a one million B? Sorry, a five million B, fifty million, or C five hundred million? Five fifty or five hundred million. Which one do you think it is? Five million. Five million. All right. So that's one. Yeah. Right. So Sarah, you get a point for actually being brave enough to uh, yeah. speak out. Again, sir. So it's five. Is either five million in a teaspoon? Five million. Fifty million. Five hundred million. A hundred million. A hundred? No, but that was one no, of the options. No, no. Um, that was we'll one. Is, that, is either five, fifty, or five hundred? Five hundred. Five hundred million. Five hundred. And the answer million. is five hundred million sperm. Yeah. Okay, hey, so who got that one? Amal. Who said five hundred million? Kamal. Sorry, sir. Kamal. My corner and I ran to me. Mm. All right, nice, good. Come out. Who else? Who, who, who else answered it? Susanna. Susanna. Yes. Yes. Right. And also, as I mentioned, Sarah would get props for being the first to respond. That was very good, Sarah. All right. The other thing is the other question: five hundred million. That's quite a lot, right? Why? Why is it the body produces 500 million sperm? Because as we're well aware, one sperm, one egg, fertilization, booyah. Why 500 million? Why 500? As many of them die, die on the way. Yes, yeah. But what does it I'm say? Not properly. What does it say about reproduction? That the body invests 500 million units so that's pretty good odds, eh? One in 500 million, you know, that's pretty good. All you need is one out of that 500 million sperm to cause fertilization. And the reason why it's done is because the process of reproduction is, I will begin with I. Is it, it is called intercourse and I would give you that. That wasn't what I was thinking of, but that is quite correct. Who answered there? Diana. Diana, okay, good. 
but you mean because it invests 500 million sperm because reproduction is blank. In terms of the process, what can you say about the process of reproduction? It is inevitable. Inevitable. Okay. That, that is partially true, and I would give you credit for that. Who said that one? Rock. Ms. Rock, yes. But it's another I would. 500 million, and you only want one. Why it could have just produced, let me say, 10 sperm, but it, your body chooses to make 500 million, and that is because reproduction is very important. Thank you very much. Name? Daniel. <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> yeah. It is very, think about it. Look, it's 500 million. You'll, you'll get props, you'll get uh, triple, triple um, on that one, Daniel. Even though it's, it's a very simple word, but the repercussions, it is important. And why is reproduction important? Because if we didn't reproduce, what would happen to us? Become Thank you. Thank you. Let me get some names. Kamal. Kamal, well, Susanna, Susanna, Natasha, yes, no. Susanna, who else? Robina, Robina, who else? Kizzy, who else? Natasha, Kizzy, sir, Kizzy, let me see, these are JK, who else? Diane, Diane, thank you, right? And it's very important because if we did not reproduce, we will disappear as a species, OMG, right? So that is why it is so critical that we reproduce. And that is why, you know, in a typical ejaculate in terms of a teaspoon of semen, you have 500 million sperm. Because yes, yeah, some of them, some of them do be formed correctly. Some might be a little special, right? In that regard, they don't do their jobs. Well, then yeah. so we could look Go at ahead. the temperature or the the woman. Remember, sperm does need to survive at a certain temperature. So correct, correct, correct. Yeah, so, but um, wouldn't the acidic environment have a part to play? Oh yeah, in terms of um, the five hundred million, yeah. So in other words. You know, one of the things I always like to highlight, your body is a machine and it has evolved over time. So probably there was a time when pff, maybe it used to produce a lot less. But you know, by the time we realized, you know what, pff, these odds are too good. So let, let's ramp it up. You know, so they ramp it up because of the fact, yes, let's say you could have, let's say for some odd reason, the vaginal environment is exceptionally acidic for whichever reason, one. So therefore the um, death rate among sperm increases. Or two, for some odd reason, let's say the sperm count from the male is low. It's not 500 million. Let's say something went wrong. Let's say the, it was um, the sperm count. Let's say the person was wearing spandex all day or something like that. Just speculating. And the count went down to, let's say, 100 million. Even if you have 400 million off, 100 million is still a lot. Right? So in other words, the body compensates for possible things that could go wrong by giving a whole big number. So at least, like as I said, in terms of the odds, all you need is one in 500 million to reach the egg. Now, how far does that sperm have to travel? I always like to tell students this. If a sperm was six feet tall and had the ability to walk, and let's say you're down by Costat in San Fernando, how far would you have to walk? to get to the egg, in, in other words, the neck of the fallopian tube, where you do have fertilization occurring. Would it have, everybody familiar with Costat in San Fernando? No, sir. No, okay. All right, so for those who are familiar with Costat in San Fernando, how far would you have to walk, eh? From Costat, from the top floor to the bottom floor, B, from the top floor up to the top of Sutton Street, C, from the top floor to KFC on Coffee Street. Yeah, or D. Let me. Um, no, I got it. I got it. Not an issue. Yeah, or D, from Costat all the way to Monrepo Roundabout. Which one? How far do you think I'll have to walk? Yeah, D. Who's that one? So that one? Daniel. Daniel, yeah. So if you could imagine is your sperm is six foot tall, right? Six feet tall. It would have to walk then the distance from Costat 
up Sutton Street, up Superior Street, turn right on Coffee Street, go all the way around on Royal Road and reach the roundabout by Monrepo. That's how far the sperm travels in terms of after ejaculation in the vaginal tract, in terms of how far it has to go from there all the way up to the egg itself. And along the way, things could go wrong, which is why coming back to the 500 million, that is why Right? Because some of them, <laughs> they could go the wrong direction, lose the chemo attractant, you know, the, the signal. So they go in the wrong direction, they head over who knows where, right? So some of them get lost along the way and so on, right? So that's why so many are produced, 500 million, right? Very important where that is concerned. Always remember that high number, you want to increase the odds, right? In terms of getting to the, to the egg. Right. So that's why I hear what you're saying. So why does then do females not produce? Why is only one egg per, per cycle? Why not? Well, you do have in certain instances where, as you're well aware, some do, but it's more rare than others. Who knows? In terms of the evolutionary process, you know, down the road, let's say, look at humans, you know, in, let's say, a million years or so. Who knows? In terms of, you know, during the cycle, you might have the release of more than one egg. To, and that as well would increase the odds of reproduction being successful. Yeah, who knows? That could be one of the things. Good, let's continue. All right, we're almost there. Fight them, fight them. So the test is lies within the screw, tell me mention that. Normal sperm production is highest. Well, that'll be false, we mentioned that. It has to be two degrees below regular body temperature. And erection of the penis is caused by what? Erection of the penis. I'm using blood. D. D. D as in dolphin. All right. Who answered that one? Daniel. Chan. Daniel. Kamal. Kamal. Who else? Ravina. Diane. Ravina. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Is an increase in arterial blood flow. And I mentioned. When, in terms of arterial blood flow, in terms of getting an erection, um, when, I think it's actually one of the, yeah, the next question. When the penis fails to become erect, what is this condition known as? Impotency. Right, I heard one, the first person who answered. All right, Suzanne. Like, Suzanne, right. So it's only, we only going with one, one for, the, for that one, Suzanne. Good. All right, impotency. Now, is that, a, is that a big problem among males globally? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah it it's a big problem. It's a huge problem. But, you know, there's a certain amount of stigma and embarrassment associated with it. So men don't really talk about that. That's not something, you know, that come up in conversation. You know, yeah, boy, you know, I'm important. No, it doesn't come up. There was a, there's a company who made a big, a big, Profit, like as I said, this was their cash cow. It still is. I'm not sure the patent came out of the drug. So even though other companies might make drugs similar to it, right? And is this this was a little blue pill? Oops, my bad. Little blue pig from Pfizer. And what was that little blue pill known as? Viagra. 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 Yeah. Sometimes people call it the Lazarus pill because if you're dead, now you you rise again. You say that in jest, of course, right? But yeah. Viagra, in terms of from Pfizer, this was a cash cow, and it, they make they made billions off of this. And again, too, wasn't talked about much because a lot of men, you know, they don't speak about it. But a lot of men have issues in terms of impotence, not being able to get an erection, right? So Pfizer made a, a lot of. And how does it work? Anybody know how does it work? Think about it. How do you think without looking, you know, how do you think it will work in terms of helping if you can't get a re an erection? How do you think a, a drug will work to make you get an erection? Oh, yeah, and that's exactly what it does. So it makes, it increases the sensitivity of nitric, of the body uh, to nitric oxide in particular, um, well, in the penis itself. Now, nitric oxide, well, nitric oxide is a vasodilator. It causes the arteries and veins to expand. So at the level of the penis, what does that do? You take your Viagra, nom, nom, nom. 
it causes any blood vessels in the penis to expand and therefore blood could flow through and now you could get an erection because one of the important things to recognize in terms of an erection a firm penis is nothing more than blood actually flowing through it so if you increase the flow of blood then you will increase the probability of getting an erection and that's that's what it does nitric oxide right it increases the sensitivity of the body to nitric oxide and that causes vasodilation that causes you to get an erection and that was the cash cow for pfizer multi-billion dollar drug in, in the caribbean there's something which they say mimics this anybody the bark of a tree Anybody ever heard about Bob it? Babwande. Yeah. How, you know how you spell that one? Bab um, one slowly. I think they Babwande. Oh, that is Nigerian. Yes. <laughs> well, clearly, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a Nigerian um Babwande. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Really bark, yes, sir. Yeah, look at here. It's Bwa. Yeah, yeah, uh, not yeah, Bab. Babwande. Yeah. yeah. So it Bande actually wasn't too far off now. Common name of several said to have aphrodisiac properties is the bark of the tree Richeria grandis. The name Bande means erect wood. <laughs> Hence the reason why they call it, you know, so that so therefore it is rumored to help with um persons who have erectile dysfunction. Right? Yeah, it has capsules. Yeah, but when they, I, I can't speak if it works or not, but you know, it, that has been in the, um, in the, in the lexicon of Caribbean talk for, from since forever, Bob and the, the bark of a tree. Okay. All right, let's continue. Hmm, let me ask this question. You know, sometimes some people wonder if somebody swallows sperm, if a female, could she get pregnant? Nope. No. No. no, sir. Right. Now, always remember as a person of science, what, do, what words do we never use? We never use absolutes, yeah? <laughs> so we don't say no, never. I don't know if you, ever, if you ever listen to somebody who's a scientist, they wouldn't use the words no or never. What do they say instead? The probability impossible. is exceedingly low. Or they wouldn't say impossible. They don't use absolutes. But you'd say things like the probability is exceptionally low right you know things like that but you, you never want to commit yourself because sometimes for some odd reason you could have an exception to the rule right so ideally and in fact that's a good way to actually pick out somebody who's a person of science who's good on science whenever you hear somebody who's uh let's say speaking on a scientific topic and they're using absolute that okay this drug once you take this drug you'll never get um let's say hiv you know right away you can probably start again <laughs> and look for the exit that the person doesn't know what they're talking about. But you know, they say the probability that you get it will be significantly reduced, so, you know, or words to that effect. So back to the question, why it is, let's say a female swallowing foam, why is it virtually impossible for her to get pregnant? Why? Because um, when the, you um, swallow it going to the stomach, it needs to go to the um, eggs one time, the ovaries one it time. It has to get to the, get to the, right, to the fallopian tube, the neck of the fallopian tube, so is there so then the question is this is there a connection between the digestive system and the reproductive system is there direct no no no, no there, no, there no. isn't right so therefore the pro and as also mentioned quite rightly there the stomach is an exceptionally harsh environment is the stomach acidic or basic acidic. Acidic. it is exceptionally acidic right so once the sperm reach there, the probability of them even getting out of the stomach is very low. So that's one. And the other thing, as also mentioned too, there's no direct connection between the reproductive and the digestive system. Now, is it possible that a sperm could, let's say everything is correct, could it survive outside of the digestive? Could it pass through the digestive tract and live? Let's say come out in fecal matter and still be alive? Possibly, <laughs> we remember it's 500 million of them, right? Is it possible? It's highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. But it doesn't mean that it's not impossible. Let's just say everything. <coughs> you know, sometimes 
Um, I, I don't know if any of y'all ever played sport. I always remembered in one particular game I played, right? I, um, we were playing uh, St. Mary up in Pershing Warners. And um, on that day, I, that was the high school I made. I, I was an opener for, I, I went to presentation in San Fernando. I was, the, I was an opener. And on that day, I made 42, right? And everything they were, it was like, every shot I tried was just coming off. You know, on that day, and I was just hitting the ball all over the place. And yet still, everybody that was coming in, they were just out in. You know, they were getting out. Get, and I was like, uh, what, you're not seeing the same? And it was the same guys who were bowling and so on. But just that everything seemed perfect for me on that day, you know, and I was just hitting the ball all over the place, you know. So that is miraculously, let's just say, if a sperm lives through the digestive tract, highly impossible, highly improbable, not impossible, right? But Let's remember to, if it does survive and come out, um, let's say the, the um, through the digestive tract at the end, through the anus, um, yeah, it still has to now enter the reproductive tract. All right, let's just say it, it does that. But if it does that, um, remember it's a harsh environment, another harsh environment, not with that. In fact, it has to go through that harsh and, oh, So it is highly, highly unlikely. Right, that that could happen. Highly, highly unlikely that, you know, if indeed somebody does swallow sperm, semen, you know, that you could get pregnant that way, right? So if somebody does that, believe you me, I get asked that question all the time, you know, in terms of persons who would approach, you know, and ask that in classes, in the classroom setting, you know, could you get pregnant by swallowing sperm? The probably answer is no. The, well, not no. <laughs> it is highly, highly unlikely because of the harsh environment of the stomach in terms of the length of time during, in the digestive tract and because it has to now re-enter from the, from the uh, inner into the reproductive tract to another harsh environment. Highly, highly unlikely. Let me ask this question. How long does sperm remain viable after ejection, you know, from the penis? How long does it remain How long viable? Is? Yeah, I say three, depending on the environmental condition, anyway, anywhere from one day to five days, it yeah. could remain viable. Now, what does that tell you, let's say for males, in terms of using prophylactics, in terms of using, um, let's say condoms, um, why, why do you have to be careful with using condoms then? around certain people who are known in the palance as gold diggers. Let's just say that. And I, I, I don't say that in any um, derisive manner, right? But there are people out there who will try to uh, get impregnated in manners which might, which might not be quote unquote normal. So what they would do. So I saw this when one time they were looking at the NFL for professional athletes. And they usually brief them when, let's say, the first, during their first year and so on, when they're now getting into, um, let's say, the NFL, uh, NBA, and so on. So they mention that, that, you know, when they do have intercourse, they have to be careful with the, the condom. Because remember, these sperm, they, they could remain viable up to a day, of, you know, in terms of after ejection. So what does that mean? There are some women, unscrupulous, right? And what they do, they will actually take the, let's say after intercourse, you know, the man takes off the condom, let's just say rest it on the, on the um, uh, bed head or on a table. What they will then do is actually take it and they could then literally impregnate themselves at that time or at some later point in time, right? Because the sperm do remain viable for up to under, once it's not a temperature wise, once the temperature is ambient, you know, cool, it will remain up to a day. So they could impregnate themselves after the fact, or even let's say, just excuse yourself and just um, either with the use of a syringe, you know, extract the semen from the condom and then inject it into their vaginal passage. That is possible. So what they tell them to do after they do use a condom, the best thing to do is to flush it down a toilet, right? because of the fact there are some unscrupulous because you're wondering now let's say you're using protection and then quote unquote nine months down the road somebody comes and tell you hey you know there's your son 
And the reason why some unscrupulous people do that, particularly with high paid athletes, is not because for paternity reasons. Once in terms of child support, child support is for 18 years, right? So if it is proven that, yes, this is your son or daughter, you will know you have to pay child support for 18 years. And in terms of a, the child support is usually given as a percentage of your net earnings. So it have some women, let's say per month, they get, let's say 10,000 US a month. That's a, that's a nice, that's a nice, you know, figure for 18 years, you know? So as I said, I know most of us would not agree with that because we have certain ethical standards, but there's some people have no problem in doing that. So all that being said, particularly to the guys out there, be careful, you know, when you do use prophylactics, you know, condoms and so on, best thing to do is flush it down the toilet once you're finished. And similarly, from a professional perspective, you know, um, this is out there in terms of um, as a parent, as a advisor or anything like that, do remember to tell males about that fact, because a lot of them don't know. And then, you know, <laughs> that could happen to them. Any comments? Nope. All right, let's move on. Three more questions. Let's go. Which accessory glass? Um, no, let's look at number nine. Seminal fluid, fluid is composed of what? All of the above. All of the above. All of the above, right. I heard two voices there. Who was those two? Shady. Let me see. Shady Davis, yes. And who else? Ravina. Ravina. Mm -hmm. you know, lighting up the bed. Yes, right? So seminal fluid, sperm, prostate, seminal, and the bulbo-urethral glands, all, all of those make up seminal fluid. So seminal fluid is not just sperm. And let's have a quick look at a sperm, shall we? When we look at a male sperm, eh, I like this one, right? We see it consists of a head, a midpiece, and a tail. What does the tail do for the sperm? Oh, the Propulsion system. How does it move? It does to move. How does it move? In terms of what motion would you have with a tail like this? So it moves how? Like a snake. Like, like a, a snake. Or right, so it moves you forward. Could this move backward? Never thought of that, eh? Could it, does it have a reverse gear? I don't think so. Yeah. And the answer is yes, it does. <laughs> now, incredible yeah. as it might sound, right? Even though it has a whip-like action, as you say, like a snake, so it'll propel. This could actually move like a propeller. It could spin. And literally, it could spin and it could spin in a reverse direction, right? I will I will send the paper for you. I kid you not. It could spin and it could move the sperm backwards. So a sperm, not only does it move forward and move towards in terms of a chemo attractant from the egg, which is how it knows which direction to go, but let's say it comes into some issue. It could actually reverse, change its direction, reverse and turn and go a different direction. Absolutely incredible. And how big is a sperm in terms of the size? Anybody? Well, of course, it's on the on the order of micro micrometers, a micrometer. It's about thirty micrometers in mm, no, not just human. Ah, I don't like fifty micrometers in size. <laughs> and how large is an egg? Um, it's a hundred, right? Yeah. Right. So it's about a hundred micron micrometers across in diameter, and the size of the sperm is how much? Um, human sperm, a hundred, and the human sperm is about fifty from head to tail, the length. So, but when you think about it. Um, hundred, this is really small, is about, the top of the head is about three micrometers. So when you think about the size of a sperm to the size of an egg, that's how much, like 33 times 
almost, let's say, rounding it up. It's for a human egg, it's 40 times as large as the nucleus of a sperm, the head part of a sperm. 40 times is a lot larger. And what does that mean? When we think about mitochondrial inheritance, right? We get most of our mitochondria from our mother, right? So mitochondria, they're actually supplied when the egg is divided. You have mitochondria present in the egg, and then it begins to divide, 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 divide. The mitochondria replicate as well. And that's how you get mitochondria being present in all your cells, right? And very importantly, yeah, we get most of our mitochondria from mothers, which is why one of the ways they could trace um, your lineage, they look at mitochondrial DNA, because mitochondrial DNA has uh, DNA with any mitochondria that comes from your mother. So they trace lineage when they're checking um, lineage in terms of, let's say, for species, they look at it from the mitochondria. Right, because you have less variation there. In the, so once you see it present, uh, let's say in a in the ext descendant of a particular species, then you can actually trace to see which one is the more which which is the original species by seeing which one has the particular genetic makeup of that mitochondria. And that's how they use it actually to, to detect or to know from a scientific perspective that life originated in Africa, right? They check the genealogy of mitochondrial species of, within the human race, you know, in, across different species. And they found the least variation occurred with persons of African descent. So therefore they knew the original species came from Africa, right? So that is, that is something that is known in the scientific world. It's a well-accepted fact and there have numerous papers written on it, right? So if ever you go to a scientific talk and you hear them talking about the origin of the species and they speak about it other than coming from Africa, well, you know, that is not good science they speak of. It's a well-accepted fact, all right? Where that is concerned. All right, we're almost there. Two more, two more questions, two more questions. Let's go. Um, do, 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 acrosome. The acrosome contains what? And when we look at a sperm, right? If we were to look at a sperm, you'd see the acrosome is this layer right here. Right, and it does have lytic enzymes that allow the sperm to penetrate the egg. So if we were to speak about the acrosome, what does it contain? Well, I kind of tell you the answer. <laughs> I told you the answer. Me. Yes, it's my bad. Yeah. Enzyme yeah, allowing the sperm to penetrate the egg. And interestingly enough, when you do have the sperm penetrating the egg, you have what is known a reaction called the block to polyspermy, where literally what the egg would do the egg would then change its morphology in the outermost layer. I think this is it here, shown here. Um, so once you have this penetration of the nucleus into the cytoplasm of the egg, this changes viscosity and it blocks other sperms from getting in. It's called a block to polyspermy. And that occurs once one penetrates the inner membrane of the egg, it blocks all the others from coming out. Well, that is what's supposed to happen ideally. We do know in terms of timing, sometimes these two will penetrate at the same time. And that can lead, of course, to fraternal twins when that occurs, right? So you have more than one sperm, um, one, more than one nucleus actually fertilizing the egg, right? But in general, you have a block to polyspermy. You don't want, because if you didn't have that block, what would happen? If you didn't have a block to polyspermy, what would happen? In terms of allowing multiple um, sperm to enter, what would that, what would that cause? What One child could have many fathers. Yeah. Well, it would cause that, true. Um, or the, the problem is, if you have more than one sperm getting in, right? So as I mentioned, when, when two get in, you could have the formation, when it begins to divide, you have, let's say, fraternal twins. So imagine now that number is increasing. There would be a limit. And that would put a lot of strain on the mother itself in terms of carrying them to term. And that could affect what? The outcome of the pregnancy. And by extension, that could 
could affect the reproduction process. If that affects the reproduction process, that would affect the numbers of person. And therefore, what would happen eventually, da, 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 you would become extinct. Right, so that is very important in terms of that block to polyspermia. You don't want too many of them going in, right? Because you'd have a whole lot um, of babies being developed and of embryos being developed there. All right, last question. Testosterone 23, testosterone, what does it do? All of, all of them. All of the above. All, e. E, all of them, yes. E, all of them. It stimulates the growth of the male genitalia. Yes. It's needed for sperm maturation. Yes. It's needed for development. Yes. Causes greater muscle development. Oh, yeah. Right. Which is why when you look at bodybuilders, male and female, that'll be the last thing we look at. We have any bodybuilders in this class? Right. Even when you look at male and female bodybuilders, right? Oh, well, hmm, she's an ages. <laughs> this woman bigger than this guy, you know? Okay, maybe this is not the best example. She's an ages. Huh. All right, this, this causes me to rethink. Okay, in general, okay, normally, quote unquote, when you do, they're not, okay, this one is probably one of the better ones. Even though women do have muscular development, they do not have the muscle mass of a male. And it has to do with testosterone. However, regrettably, with the use of hormones, right? So some of these persons, they do take testosterone that builds up their muscle mass, right? And um, they could get rather large, but normally, normally, males have a predisposed musk um, to be larger than females. And that has to do with testosterone, all right? So testosterone stimulates the growth of the male genitalia, yes. Needed for, yes, and all of these things are true, okay? So we'll stop there for today.